So welcome to this episode of CanCast. I'm joined today by the very fabulous Pete Gary Carroll, who's a drug expert witness for West Midlands Police, and he was on our CanCard Police Working Group. Um, and he, he's awesome, so I'm really excited to be chatting to him today. Thanks for joining us, Gary. No, no problem. Thanks for the invite. We've, uh, we've finally made it happen, uh, which was... Sorry, I dropped the pen. Uh, <laughs> so we've finally got here. No, I'm happy uh, to be here and, you know, talking about this can cards for one and uh, the whole topic around cannabis uh, and hopefully dispelling some of the myths around law enforcement and, uh, and yeah, opening up a few, a few minds to the topic. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that I didn't, I didn't know, and perhaps people will want to know. Um, I obviously know now because of you. But can you tell us what a bit about your background, firstly, and also what do drug expert witnesses do? Yeah. So, uh, so my background: I've been a police officer for just over eleven years um, in total. My predominant length of service has been spent on uh, drug enforcement teams, um, gang enforcement, uh, drugs and firearms, pretty much not long after I started. So I've, I've been quite pigeonholed in my career into just these topics, um, which kind of culminated in me joining the drug expert witness team about four years ago. Uh, this came around, the opportunity came up. Um, the role itself is, is an unusual one. Um, it's something that not a lot of people know exists, and, and that includes police officers. I still get phone calls to this day uh, for advice on cases, and, and these are seasoned police officers that don't know the drug expert witnesses are, are there uh, to, to help matters. Um, so talk about the, the role itself, really. Um, every force um, in the, the UK will have a, a drug expert witness department team or a small number of officers within that force that are trained to do drug expert witness work. Now, the role and what makes it unusual is that it's impartial. So even though we are paid by our force, our, our employer, whether it's West Midlands Police or GMP, the Met, even though we're paid by them, we're there to serve the court. So we're not there to help the prosecution. We're not there to help the defence. We are there literally to put colour in an otherwise relatively black and white criminal investigation um, is the, the kind of best way I put it across. As you can appreciate, drug supplies, there's not a blueprint blueprint, blueprint uh, to drug supply. So we are there to, to kind of fill in the gaps. We'll explain to the court and explain to the jury simple stuff like the relevance in someone having three mobile phones or the relevance in having a thousand pound cash in the boot of the car or even the relevance of a, a SIM card strapped to the, the underface of a watch. You know, some simple things that some members of society will think, I know exactly why he's got that. But yeah. then there'll be others that will have absolutely no idea. They'll have a very, very sheltered life, quite isolated to the, 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 the modern, you know, criminal world, or, you know, they may not read the papers. So if they're in a jury, they, they, they may not know what these what these things mean so we literally go there to court to explain what to do the benefits of this tactic and uh and, and why it's in drug supply so because it's impartial means we help uh then we help the court as opposed to to one side or the other amazing that's a really good summary that yeah i think that'll help people understand it a bit more because that's something that i you know even though i'm sort of in the sort of drug reform space i didn't even know um I didn't even know you guys existed, so it's been really great to learn a bit more about what you guys do. Um, on the, you know, on the police working group, we obviously work with lots of different ranks of police and lots of different specialists. And they, the one thing that ran true through the whole um, of that was that police thought that it would free up their resources and help them. Yeah. Do you think that CanCard will help the drug expert witnesses? So. Uh... In a, in a degree, yes, across the board, uh, it should help. Um, how much it helps is probably down to the individual force. So I, myself and West Midlands Police, we, we are an extremely busy drug expert witness team, um, just sheerly due to the demand and how many, how many drug suppliers there are in existence in, in the region. Um, so with cannabis possession cases, which is probably more uh, more suited to the can cards uh, arena, 
Um, we don't tend to get involved in them as much. It does, it does take up a small amount of our time. Um, so hopefully with CanCard, it will free up that small amount of time for, for other things. But other forces will have a much more, uh, a much more involvement in cannabis possession cases. Um, so really it's force specific, but some forces will, they will, uh, will benefit a lot more than others. But across the board, it will, should, in theory, certainly have a, a, a positive impact. That sounds great. That sounds great. And as a, as, I suppose, as a witness or, or as an officer, what, what criteria would you use to assess whether a CanCard patient is a patient or a criminal for the purposes of like testimony? Or, or I know it's a tricky question. <laughs> yeah, um, but no, there is there are some things that you can apply. Um, okay. Like I said, there's not there's never a blueprint. There's never a set list of what you have to do. So a lot of it comes down to common sense that things that we would use, but probably things that a random member of the public would use. Um, so we'd look at the backgrounds. Um, is it someone that gets regularly stopped with cannabis? Um, uh, can they afford to sustain the habit that they're claiming to have? Uh, I mean, I've spoke to you in the past about some, some crazy accounts that we get in an interview. Uh, you know, the, the cookie monster defense. It's all mine and I'm going to eat it and I'm going to bathe in it and I'll smoke. 400 pounds worth every two days you know so so, so a lot of it we, we we judge on it is from what they tell us as a as someone who's stopped or a defendant or a patient or a customer um there's nothing set in stone but i think a lot of it comes down to common sense if they're a patient stuff that we'd certainly look to um inquire about is is why are they a patient um you know have they got any disabilities medical needs to to consume the cannabis um and you know i'll touch on this later on but but what the circumstances tell us the big problem that i face with cannabis uh from speaking to agencies like yourself uh, other private companies um is that uh, cannabis users get tarnished with a brush yep. due, due to the acts of a small minority of cannabis consumers in the uk um and it's i suppose it's like a lot of drug commodities whether it's um, you know, heroin users, they're not all going to be homeless beggars in the city centre. There'll be heroin users that are functioning and, and work nine to five. Uh, but they all get tarnished with that same brush because it's the acts of a few. Cannabis users, people straight away go to the old oh, group of young lads wanting to buy my house, smoking a massive spliff. It's the antisocial aspect that really, it really loads that brush full of tar that gets smeared across the, the cannabis consumer market, unfortunately. So I think the good thing with agencies like yourself, it's going to help them dispel some of the myths and showing, yeah. uh, showing the, the more human side of a lot of cannabis consumers that, that choose to take it for, for medicinal purposes. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think that's a really good point, actually. And I think, you know, my experience and a lot of, a lot of patients' experience is that it's been somewhat of an exit drug for us. Yeah. And it's got me off morphine and fentanyl and benzos and all kinds. And but also it's it's changed my life so significantly that I you know, I've gone from being bedbound and in a wheelchair yeah. to now working sometimes twelve hours a day. Um, and so I've been uh, the the medicine has allowed me to be more productive and and be a more a better member of society, really, and contribute with taxes and you know whatever I'm I'm able to contribute and it's been a, a turnaround so I think you're right I think there is a lot of um myths that need to be spelling I think, yeah. I think that is part and parcel of, of why things are possibly taking longer than they should be doing in in sort of furthering the need for this medicine yeah I, I would say it's a massive impact I think um I mean we all know the laws in the UK are quite i'd say well established but some so they're a bit draconian they're, they're quite old uh and the, the way of working the mysteries of drugs act is obviously 1971 that gets amended over the years um and we're probably not caught up as quickly as other countries um about around dealing with cannabis uh, and that's reflected in the way we deal with hemp the way we deal with cbd and the way we deal with medicinal cannabis it's getting there it's going in that right direction we've got um we've got you know numerous massive worldwide companies that are based in the UK um, that are huge because they're, they're medicinal cannabis companies. We had GW Farm sold, what, 7.2 billion last week or the week before. 
Um, there was another company that came up uh, on the on the IPO, uh, Cannibal, um, which recently went to shares and doubled in price overnight. Uh, and there were some other companies that are coming through. So it's, it's a massive industry, mm. uh, multi-billion pound industry in the UK that it's it's you know it's, it's getting a lot of benefits. So I think it'll be it's only a matter of time before the government kind of starts looking at it in a more um, modern modern way and realizing that you know do you know what it's maybe we should look to amend this or tweak that etc. Uh, you know I need to be careful on what I promote uh, with my role, but I think certainly there's, there's there's room in there for a more modern way of looking at cannabis as a drug. Uh, and then I think really legislation will catch up eventually. Maybe not as free and easy as some countries, um, but you know it's certainly it'll get there at some point. I think. Yeah, I really hope so. I know you know it's a it's a big pain in the ass really to be changing laws. <laughs> the process that goes with all of that, you know, I, when I started looking into how to challenge this or how I can make something to help patients. Um, obviously, you know, can cards based on you know the fact that we are you know we aren't changing the law. We're just using discretion and, and sort of guidance and support from from people like the National Police Chiefs Council and, and stuff so yeah I mean I think that it does need to be taken seriously um, and you know and there's also a lot of studies happening around long Covid and stuff which I think might sort of um, help to move things forward in the right direction because what's been interesting about Covid is that it's accelerated the change of laws yeah. for Covid related things um, and it's made it easier for, for those law changes and things to pass through Parliament. So fingers crossed that we get yeah. some movement um, no, yeah, for, the, for the patients and for the police, really. It's, you know, it's one of those things where lots of people are affected. Um, yeah. No, yeah. I mean, with, the, with the modern way that um, companies like yourself are kind of promoting this, um, it, it's, it's showing a lot of people that aren't in this industry or, or aren't in this world um, that another side of the coin does exist. Uh, and you know, medicinal users, patients, uh, you know, whatever title we put, um, show a more a more, a more human aspect to the to the consumer market. Because, like I said, the stereotypical view is a strong one that exists, and it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of time to dispel that. Um, and you know, they, they have to take a hell of a lot of blame uh, for causing that. You know, whenever they are in the UK, there's always going to be people that are consuming the drug irresponsibly that are ruining it for a very large proportion of people that need it as a medicine um but uh you know i think that held, held, getting held accountable is uh, is another thing <laughs> for the yeah research. yeah absolutely and can you think of a couple of things that would make your job easier when dealing with patients in possession at the moment before there is a law change um I suppose the, the, the CAN card obviously will allow officers on the street to have all the information to hand. That's always going to be the problem. Um, information sharing between police forces, medical companies, NHS, etc. Uh, there, there's things in place to make that happen, but it's it's not the easiest. Um, I mean, we had the, the the Management of Police Information Act brought in uh, a while back, and it was to go in that direction to allow partner agencies to work more closely together to share information but it's not an easy process um i think we can card that gives the officers during that initial stop and search if we look at right back at stage one where they're going to encounter uh, a patient uh, con consuming cannabis for medicinal needs it gives them that information to hand gives them the the helpline number and then obviously they've got all the, the police tools that they can use the pnc uh, to check on someone's criminal background, we can if someone's selling a ticket for medicinal needs, but they've got form for you know being locked up for supply twelve times in the last five or six years. It's, it gives them a bit more information, more bows to the string, uh, and you know they, there's no such thing as too much information. So so this helps massively in the officer on the street way back at stage one, formulating uh, kind of what to do next scenario, whether it's using discretionary powers. Um, or going down another route. Yeah, absolutely. And are, and are there any tools that would help make your job easier, or anything that West Mids have got in the pipeline around sort of drug reform um, that you might want to share? Yeah, so so Timon's really good on this actually. Um, West Midlands Police, we're, we've always been quite good with diversion, uh, diversion um, areas. You know, we've got the uh, you know, sexual offences, we've got some other drug diversion programmes, um, low level assaults, 
uh, loads for under 18s kids coming out of coming out of school. Recently, there's been things in motion to create a cannabis diversion program where those with the appropriate criminal backgrounds who haven't got form for substantial offences related to the drug uh, will be given the option. So it's a bit like uh, like a seeking offence or driving offences. If you get caught speeding, you get the driver awareness program. Um, so you'll get that option as opposed to taking the three points. Um, a similar program is going to be set up for cannabis users. Now, I don't know the all ins and outs of this. Uh, it is in motion. It has been approved. And uh, hopefully in the not too distant future, um, it's going to be a, a viable option um, for officers to use on the ground. Rather than go down the, the criminal route, we've got this diversion program and we give the, the person stops the choice. So they can opt for the easy one day awareness session or two days, however it's going to be, or they can go down the criminal route if that's, if that's what they choose. Um, this is going to help in a lot of ways. It's going to obviously free up officer time, for one. If you look at everything that's involved in arresting someone, taking them into custody, interviewing, solicitor, appropriate adult, medical needs, because everybody that comes into custody has got a problem of some sort, so there's a nurse that gets brought in as well. The money just gets added up constantly. Uh, and then we've got court. Courts are at a two or three year backlog at the moment due to COVID. The last thing they want to do is get bombarded with people with a 50 quid, 100 quid worth of cannabis. Uh, in some circumstances, they have to be there, and we fully appreciate that. But in a lot of circumstances, they don't. And I think this can free up court resources as well, which allows us to use those allocated slots for more substantial offences. Mm -hmm. Um, so the benefit, not to put a price on everything, but it's it's really important in these things because it has to justify um, our time going into it and the public purse. Uh, we'll save a fortune with diversion programmes like this if people use it, which I'm more than confident is going to be very popular. Um, and also, we're not criminalising people. We're giving people an opportunity to get more information on the drug that they're choosing to take, if they're one of these irresponsible users smoking a spliff at a bus stop, this gives them the free to go in the course, give them pers perspective about other people, why it's antisocial, why it shouldn't happen. Uh, if you were to smoke cannabis, then probably more appropriate ways of consuming the drug. Um, so yeah, it's got a, a, the list is endless for the benefits. Hopefully when it comes in, uh, it will snowball effect and uh, it will be a, a very popular for West Midlands Police. Um, we're not the first in the UK. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's one other force that does it. So hopefully this will create a knock-on effect to other forces, like a lot of things, really. We all tend to copy each other at some point. Um, so eventually, down the line, if it's a success here, as it is in the other force, then you'll find it will just get rolled out across others. So, uh, yeah, positive step forwards. Definitely a time saver for resources, big money saver for the public purse, and it frees up a lot of time at court. Amazing, it's amazing news. I'm, I'm a massive fan of diversion schemes. And I really hope that um, Pancard can sort of complement those schemes. Because, you know, I think that there are sort of, you know, there are, there is a need for diversion schemes for problematic consumers. Uh, but I think patients don't easily sit into that because a lot of the time, you know, they might not want to kind of talk to, to, to learn about medicine that's already helping them. So, so in that case, you know, it might be that we can support by providing some information on consumption methods and things like that, if, you know, if they're problematically consuming by smoking outdoors. Or, you know, there's lots of things that we can, we can try and sort of slot in and make sure that we're, we're complementing those schemes rather than opposing them. Yeah, well, I think uh, you, you definitely had a good point there. It probably wouldn't be the appropriate environment for the patient, um, you know, it's aware of that. You know, serious illness. Uh, the last thing they want to do is sit in the room and get told, uh, you know, they shouldn't do this or this can lead to side effects when you know it's helping them function, uh, yeah. function in life. It's, uh, yeah, so it probably wouldn't be suitable, but what it could be is uh, an area where can cards could potentially be promoted to that person to say, yeah. well, if you had a can card, this maybe wouldn't have happened. The discretionary power may have kicked in by the officer who initially stopped you and. Uh, you know, you're, you're being tucked up in bed or sat at home. Um, and, you know, it probably come down to responsible use, uh, education more than anything. Yeah, absolutely. That's amazing. I'm really excited to see these these programmes roll out and I really hope we can be a part of trying to, trying to help with that. And, um, yeah, it's, you know, it's brilliant. 
the, no, the, the last question I've been asking people and, and, uh, and I'm not sure how you're going to answer it, but I, I'll ask it anyway. Is, um, if you had a magic wand and you could just wave it over this whole sort of cannabis situation, what do you think would be, what, what would you like to see change? Wow. Oh, wow. Right. Um, a lot of the time, and you, you know this yourself, Carly, the argument with uh, pro-cannabis use, um, I mean, I've done a lot of work with, uh, you know, CTA, Clear, uh, CBD companies up down the UK, um, and it, the, the one scenario always comes up, why don't they just legalise it and we'll earn zillions in tax uh, and we'll save a lot of money, you know, through the course. I understand that argument, and I think, it's right to a degree, um, but it comes down to a responsible use. Um, if we compare it to other countries, uh, US, Canada, for example, uh, we often get compared to them. Well, Canada legalized it and they don't have a drug problem. Well, they do. I mean, I've, I've been in inputs with DEA agents, uh, with the Canadian Mounted Police. Their legalization of cannabis has not had a huge impact in the black market of cannabis. I agree with that. Um, what it's done is it's created a new market of cannabis. Basically, uh, the way I look at the cannabis market is you've got the people who use because they just like cannabis. They don't need to use, but they love the drug, so they'll use it. You've got medicinal market, um, you know, like yourself. Yeah, they need it to function and for its uh, medicinal benefits. Uh, and then you've also got a society, a section that probably want to use but they're not quite brave enough to break the law. So when countries like Canada bring in legislation and say, right, you can smoke cannabis, but under these conditions, it doesn't have an impact in the black market. The medicinal users, fantastic. It gives them a more, uh, I suppose, structured way of sourcing the cannabis, albeit very expensive from, uh, from all accounts. But it really has an impact in this third section that kind of want to use the drug but were too scared in the past. So now all I've done is created this section to come forward and start buying cannabis. The black market's unaffected because when government's involved, whether it's tobacco or alcohol, we all know the first thing they're going to do is heavily tax it. If cannabis is heavily taxed, the price is obviously going to go up. People are used to paying one, uh, 10 pounds for one gram of cannabis. Yep. They're not going to go to a government dispensary and start paying £25 for another gram of cannabis, uh, two and a half times the price, just because there's no risk of getting arrested. The, this section, right, the ones that were too scared to get arrested in the first place, they'll pay that price. But this massive section who just like cannabis, they're not going to use these dispensaries. So the black market is always going to be there. Um, so legalising cannabis is, is always the big argument. but. Um, I'm not sold in that it's going to solve the problem. What it will do is make it easier for a lot of people who are good people um, that could benefit with cannabis but don't want to get criminalised. It will help them massively. And if something could be brought in to help them, fantastic. Cannabis has got some, uh, sorry, Canada has got some strict conditions um, with consuming in your own home, not in public, the maximum quantity you're allowed to hold, um, not in a premises with children, uh, not in a vehicle. So it's great. They've kind of given a bit, but they've heavily restricted it. Um, so I think the, the magic wand question would be for us to get maybe more relaxed yeah. uh, so that it frees up a wealth of resources and a lot of money. There's no way in hell that it's going to um, get rid of the black market of cannabis. Uh, that's always going to be there, um, and criminals will always get rich on it, and they're always going to earn a living through it. Um, so I would say. Yeah, we we get more more modern in our approach with dealing with cannabis is probably the, the best umbrella term we could use, uh, and hopefully police forces will use discretion a bit more when it needs to be applied. Um, I mentioned before, there's always going to be people that have to get taken to the courts, but if it's not necessary, then do we really need to do it? Um, diversion programs hopefully will, will massively help us, um, and companies such as yourself give the officers on the grounds that information uh, that they can make the decision on whether or not they can uh, or whether or not they go through that diversion, they go through discretion or they go through the criminal procedures. Amazing. I've never heard it broken down like that, but it makes so much sense actually. And when I think about my experience in Canada, you're absolutely right what you're saying. Yeah. So that was a really good summary. 
Um, all right, well, thank you so much. Thanks so much for joining us, Gary. It was really, really cool to chat. Thank you for answering my questions. You're a legend and you're clearly very well versed as well. It's, it's really nice to chat to somebody who really knows their stuff. Oh, thank you. I might quote that next time I'm in court. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll give you that quote. I'll give you that quote. But I'm going to stop recording. Um, I'll stop recording by hang on for a minute. So thanks so much, Gary. Take care.